Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and today we're going to be talking about target date funds. Are they good? Are they bad? Are they misunderstood? Yes, maybe, yes, probably. Okay. So target date funds are one of those things that really started to pick up some steam as far as the debate after the 2008 and then into 2009 financial crisis. And target date funds are well-intentioned. They became part of the financial realm in sometime in the 1990s. And when you think about a target date fund, it's what a lot of investors who get employed, enroll in a 401k, and often they are auto-enrolled into some sort of an age-based asset allocation depending upon you know when they, they pick their retirement. So what are they? All right, so when you think about someone who is very, very young as a worker, the idea is, okay, you want to have more of your money in equities. Somebody gets older, they get closer to retirement, they want to take less risk. That's when maybe they peel back and they go into more fixed income or bonds. So very well-intentioned. And I mean, there's a couple of things here. A lot of companies nowadays auto-enroll their employees in the 401k. And that's sort of a way to, not necessarily to force people, but just to, to nudge or encourage people. You know, there's a lot of benefits to, to starting early, to saving on a periodic basis. You're making contributions to a 401k um, pre-tax dollars, meaning the reduction in the paycheck isn't as much as you think. Many companies, they offer matching funds up to a certain percent. So there's a lot of benefits. The downside of a 401k is generally you've got sort of a limited amount of options, meaning you you get shown a a menu of mutual funds, and these are the ones that you can pick from, and it's, it's a little more limited. But a target date fund sort of wanted to solve the the issue of an employee not maybe going in and changing the allocations as they got older. And so think of it this way. Someone gets a job right out of college. They're 22, 23, 21, right? They should be more uh, in equities, meaning stocks. They should be more aggressive because they have many, many years until retirement. And especially early on as you're sort of dollar cost averaging and adding money on a periodic basis, many years until retirement. And so the target date fund looked to solve the problem of somebody like that who sort of sets up their initial allocation and never goes in and changes it. What the target date funds did and do is they take somebody and they say, hey, when are you going to retire? And then what happens is as you get closer to that retirement date, and so let's say someone who's working right now um, you know, they say, oh, I'm going to retire in 2045, 2045. The closer one gets to 2045, the more the asset allocation shifts from equities to a combination of bonds and short-term vehicles. And it follows what's called a glide path. And a glide path, you know, you think about an airliner coming in for a landing. And it's just this idea that Somebody who has 25 years to retirement, maybe is more in equities. Somebody with 10 years has more bonds, maybe a little bit of short-term fixed income or bonds. And then somebody five years out, they start, you know, the glide path, meaning less equities, less stocks, more fixed income, and then they reach retirement. And one important thing to think about with these products is that they don't terminate on retirement date they sort of also continue on post-retirement because the idea is that someone needs to still get a little bit of growth, more conservative post-retirement as they bring bring that, uh, you know, enter the drawdown period. So very well intentioned. It looks to solve the problem of someone who just never goes in and does any rebalancing or changes the allocations. And it's an age-based allocation. And so when we think about target date funds, really all they're doing is trying to use age as the primary driver. And it's trying to use classic asset allocation to determine, you know, what investments are in the account. So the intention is good. But there's a couple things that, and this especially came to light in 2008, 
that maybe people misunderstood about these products? Well, there's really a couple main things, right? The first is that people, rightly or wrongly, uh, had maybe this perception that target date funds when you picked a, a retirement date And so the examples I'll give you in 2008, there were people who said, hey, I'm going to retire in 2010. We've got a 2010 retirement date fund. So essentially, you know, two years later, and some of those took big losses. And so a lot of people maybe thought that there was some sort of embedded downside protection that guaranteed or protected the assets against a decline. Remember, all the target date funds are doing is they're going uh, less in equities, more in fixed income or bonds. You know, there obviously you can have international, you can have different types of bonds, but generally, you know, closer to retirement, you are more of a you know fifty fifty or sixty forty split. You know, it just kind of depends on the company. And so that was one of the misperceptions with regards to these products. The other misperception, I, I sort of already mentioned it, and it's this idea that the fund or, you know, these, these target date funds had sort of a termination date at retirement. And the reality is, you know, you look at, if you think about 25 years to retirement, 15, 10, five, and then zero is at retirement. And then it's like plus five in retirement, plus 10 in retirement, plus 15. These funds keep going naturally. And just as an advisor would help a, a client out, they would be sort of managing, their situation through retirement as well as as they're going to the distribution phase. And so one of maybe the misconceptions was that these funds sort of terminated. To give you an example, if you think about one of those 529 plans, which is basically saving for college, that's a term more of a terminal event, meaning when the, the child reaches college age, let's say 19 years or older, they're in college or they're about to start college, they would bring the stock allocation down to something like, you know, 5%. And then it would be mostly cash equivalents, fixed income, maybe, you know, a little bit of international bonds. But that's that's definitely one of the misconceptions. So one of the things that happened after 2008, 2009 is Congress or the Senate, and there's a committee on aging, they held hearings on these products and they held hearings about everything from were the products poorly designed? Did they need more disclosures? Uh, you know, any, any bit of thing, right? And a couple things that came out from that, and I actually wrote this, uh, I call it the target date surprise in my book, Broken Pie Chart. But there's a couple things that came out of that. And one was the variation in the returns of the drawdowns. And so to give you an example, in if you look at, so the, the 2010 target dated funds, right? So that, that says, hey, this person's gonna retire in 2010. If we look at how they performed from the market peak in October of 2007 through the March 2009 troughs, that was a, the very low of the market, if we just pick, uh, you know, say a handful of these, and these could be anything, uh, you know, number of different fund companies, let's say the S&P 500 was down, you know, peak to trough, roughly 55%. And then these target date funds, you know, just kind of picking a handful, were anywhere from minus 33% to minus 40%. And there was one that had even more losses um, I think that one had some mortgage-backed bonds, and we all know what happened with housing and mortgages in 2008. And so, you know, that was one of the things that they pointed to. There's a lot of variation. And the reality is that variation is there because not every company had the same design of what percent would go in what bucket. And the other is some companies, as I mentioned, might have used maybe more towards international, maybe some mortgage-backed bonds but you would expect to see some variation. And so, you know, that's that's one of the things, um, but it, I found it quite interesting because when they held hearings on the target date funds, I was, I sort of stepped back a little bit and I said, look, if they have a problem or if people have find fault with target date funds, 
really what they're saying is that classical asset allocation models are, are not good. I mean, essentially, that's what they're saying, because all target date funds do in some form or fashion, and they might, all the fund families might do it a little bit differently, but all they're doing is doing an age-based allocation, and they're putting money into assets, and as the person gets older, they shift less to equities, more to bonds, which, by the way, is sort of the classic asset allocation. If you think about the efficient frontier and global minimum variance portfolios and you know, looking at 70 or 80 years worth of stock market returns and 60-40 portfolios, that's all classic asset allocation. So is it the target date funds or is it classic asset allocation that really is the issue that let people down in 2008-2009? Now, many of you know who listen to the program and have read the book or look at the website and look at the, the articles or familiar with the strategies that, that I sort of uh, champion. You know, these products, just like classical asset allocation, they have no downside hedges. They have no embedded downside hedges. All they're doing is choosing different asset types that they're looking at many years of historical data and they're looking at correlations and saying, look, if we have this mix of stocks and bonds, we believe it's going to give us a good risk-adjusted return, and it will protect to the downside. But let me be clear, target date funds or classic asset allocation have no embedded downside hedges. So if someone says you know, target date funds aren't good, really the question they should be asking is, is classic asset allocation um, really what's going on there? So... Anytime you have hearings, one of the things that they said was there should be more disclosures. And look, I'm, I'm all for more disclosures. Uh, people should know what they're investing in. But I don't know that you know, more disclosures necessarily would, would have impact or would have not had drawdowns in 2008. So that really speaks to the risk. The other thing and the challenge with some of these products is that I mean, all you're doing is you're looking at what is in, let's say, this 401k. And you can buy these outside of 401ks, right? But generally, a lot of these are contained in 401ks. And I think I saw a stat that about 20% of all retirement assets are actually in target date funds now. But one of the challenges that I see on this is there's no personalization and there's no really accounting for anyone's individual situation. And there's a couple things there. The first is you could have someone who has a lot of assets and doesn't need any more growth and has what they need for retirement and will have the ability to draw down the account um, you know, at 4% a year and still have assets and have them last. For that person, they might be taking too much risk and it's only looking at age. It's not looking at their asset level. On the other hand, Somebody who maybe doesn't have enough and still needs growth and is shifting more and more to fixed income, you know, maybe that's not the, the right allocation. Maybe they simply need more growth and that retirement date that they initially picked isn't really feasible anymore. They're going to have to keep working. And so that to me is a challenge where these products, again, well-intentioned and but it doesn't have any personalization to the individual situation. So I think that's sort of an issue. The other issue I have with some of these is that they only look at the one account. We know that most people have multiple accounts. They might have old 401ks. They've got taxable money, non-taxable money, maybe real estate, maybe you know uh, a baseball card collection. Okay, I'm joking about that. Baseball cards or not necessarily a liquid investment, but you get the idea. And when you only look at somebody's situation in a single account instead of looking at it more globally, it's really not taking the whole picture into account. And so when you've got an age-based only asset allocation and there's a lot of assets that are outside in different accounts, that might not be the, the best allocation for somebody. And so I bring that up because um, I think, and, and by the way, also, you might have a lot of duplication. There could be mutual funds that represent equities and in these uh, target date funds, and you have mutual funds in other accounts or ETFs in other accounts, 
And you might find when you do correlations and you look at what the holdings are, that there's a lot of duplication. This debate also continues on really what the right percentage is. I mentioned before that one of the things when they did those hearings, what they found was a lot of variance within looking at, let's say, a Fidelity target date fund or a T. Rowe Price or a Vanguard or any of these, there was just this variability to the returns. And so there's this ongoing debate around, okay, somebody is 50 years old, should they have 50% in stocks? Should they have 70% in stocks? And one of the things that was sort of interesting from that debate, it seemed like people thought that individuals had too great a percentage in stocks closer to retirement. And they seem to be suggesting that maybe more bonds was the answer. But here's sort of the challenge with bonds. And I think with with the really, really low yield in bonds, and the reality is bonds yield or return above inflation, inflation really isn't getting that much. Maybe your real return is your return minus inflation. And so if you were to buy you know, a 10-year bond and get 3% right now, and inflation is 2 2.5%, your real return is something like a half percent to 1%. And I think also with bonds, we may see a situation if interest rates or inflation were to start to really materialize, we could see some negative returns in, in bonds. And I made this point before that when we look at rises in interest rates or periods of rising interest rates, everybody looks at the 1970s, and they say, you know, look, bonds didn't do that bad. But here's the thing. Bonds were paying a much higher percent of interest back then, which sort of buffered or muted any market value losses as interest rates went up. It's not the case right now. We're not seeing 10-year treasuries paying 10, 11, 12 percent. The 10-year treasury, as it stands today, is under 3 percent. And so I bring this up because bonds are offering little real return, um, yet a lot of people are calling for a higher percentage in bonds. And so these are, you know, a lot of things to consider. And here's a couple things. I realize that 401ks, um, I mentioned it before, the challenge is there's not a lot of choice within them. A worker signs up, they get a booklet or they get this, uh, this online menu and they say, here are the stock funds, here are the international funds, here are some bond funds. These are the fund families. This is what you can do. And all really your choices are, are traditional mutual funds. And But if you've got assets that are outside of the 401k, that's where you can start getting creative. That's where you can stay and have more of an allocation to equities, but do so in a strategy that has embedded downside buffers or hedges that limit the downside And that makes being in equities a little bit more palpable and lets you sleep a little better at night as opposed to just being in equities or being in funds and not having downside protection. All we need to do is point to the 2008-2009 experience. Uh, The other thing that I would say, too, is if you're somebody who has had a 401k for a while and you've got assets elsewhere, it might be time to take a look and see how much duplication you have across the different accounts. And what I mean there is, let's say you're in these age-based funds, or you're in a 401k, but you've got taxable accounts, meaning investment accounts, you've got an old IRA, 401k rollover, IRA rollover. It might be a good idea to take a look and have somebody review the assets and see how much risk overlay that you have, meaning you may have large cap U.S. exposure in your 401k, and you've got the same stuff in your other accounts. And so now is a good time to do that. But again, I mean, 401ks, uh, they are well-intentioned, the target date funds. They essentially do what they said they were going to do, which is just move the assets to a more conservative allocation the closer one gets to retirement. And when 2008, 2009 happened, and you saw really big drawdowns, A lot of people were surprised, but again, all they're doing is they're doing classic asset allocation, that classic pie chart where you've got a certain percentage in stocks and a certain percentage in bonds. And if markets go down and you don't have any real hedges in there, which they don't, 
then you should expect uh, losses. And, and so that's, uh, that's one of the benefits, I think, to using hedged equity strategies or buffered strategies. It just makes things a little bit better when you can have real defined protection on the downside. All right, folks, I hope that uh, was instructive. I'll do a couple links, as I always do in the write-up and the show notes, and we'll be back next week with uh, another episode. Music